do it in a one-liner. Um, there are many ways to do it in Scala, probably more, many more ways than you can do it in Java. And I chose one of them because uh, I believe that it's a, it's a good way to, to show some key concepts, uh, uh, important concepts in the language. So let's look at this example. What we want to produce is, uh, is the sequence of all the Fibonacci numbers. Right? Uh, the way that we are going to produce them is uh, using streams. Um, so uh, who doesn't know what a stream is? OK. So uh, basically, a stream is a lazy collection. Okay. It's very similar to a list, which is a linked list, but with one minor difference. The difference is that the tail of the list, right? each list consists of uh, the head and the tail, right? the first element and the rest. The tail is, uh, is lazy, which means that only when you call it, uh, when you access these members, they get materialized. That's all. And this allows us to, to basically work with the infinite strings and, uh, and do very cool stuff. So in this case, uh, we basically produce, uh, produce a stream of the Fibonacci numbers. The other thing which is important to, to say about this example is that uh, we use uh, recursive values, which are not different than uh, recursive functions, right? We talked about the, uh, the, the, in the previous uh, talk. Uh, which means that uh, when you call something or access some uh, member from the outside, it doesn't really matter if it's a function or a value. It just changes the, the moment at which it is materialized and evaluated. Here we see some uh, not very, uh, very human-readable uh, operator, which uh, just uh, um, joins and combines two strings. In fact, uh, it just uh, puts this uh, value in front of this stream. And this stream uh, basically uses the scanf function. The scanf function is uh, very similar to, to the fold function. OK, so who hasn't ever used the fold function? OK. Anyway, anyway. So. Yeah. Um, so the fault function basically uh, it's uh, it's a reducer function. It uh, basically scans all the members of a collection, and uh, instead of just producing one value uh, like we do with the fault function, here we also uh, produce and uh, output all the intermediate products of the aggregators. And this is exactly what we want to do with the Fibonacci, right? We want to to produce all the the intermediate values uh, of the Fibonacci sequence. Um, so now we know what recursive values are, what streams are. Uh, we, we talked a bit about the scan. And um, uh, I think I also mentioned the binary placeholder notation, which means basically that uh, the scan, just like the fold uh, function, uh, has the, the aggregator and the current vendor which is actually a tuple. Uh, and uh, we basically use the addition uh, method or uh, operator uh, on uh, the aggregator and the, uh, the current member. We return or get or yield right, uh, the current uh, aggregated value and then move next. <coughs> so this is a warm-up example. Uh, I think uh, that uh, you probably heard the word immutable uh, quite a few times today. So uh, usually when, uh, whenever we talk about immutability, we do talk uh, about uh, collections, but that's not always the case. Uh, here we are going to focus on collections only, so let's talk about immutable collections. Um, give me a few reasons why uh, we want immutability in collections. All right. Right, uh, if you want to, to write a parallel code. Anything else? Agree. Yeah. Uh, and there is actually a third reason. The third reason is that in many cases it will actually be more uh, efficient uh, from the computational standpoint. 
One example would be uh, if we have a linked list, okay, and an immutable list, and we want to prepend an element, basically a new head to the list. We do not really need to copy the entire list. All we need to do is basically make the head point to the first to the new element, but we still have the reference uh, to the old. avoid memory allocation for uh, empty collections. The second one is that we can actually, whenever we create a new empty collection, mostly an immutable one, uh, then uh, there is a very optimized code. I will show it in a second. Uh, we will touch the equal hash code contract. And uh, also mention a few aspects of the asymptotic behavior of uh, common operations on collections. I think the, the smallest example that one can start with would probably be the nil. Uh, so nil is uh, just a, a symbol that represents the, the empty list. Okay? There is nothing special about it. And this is the entire code of nil, uh, which was written by Martin Odersky quite a few years ago, 10 years ago, right? Yeah, quite accurate. Um, now, what we can immediately see in the implementation of, uh, of nil is that it's an object and not a class. Any idea why? I think that uh, I heard the, the right keywords, but I have no idea who said this. So yes, the, that's exactly the reason. Uh, we do not need to, to allocate uh, new memory whenever we create an empty collection, just like we were more used to in Java. This is the first thing. The second one is that uh, there are uh, uh, specialized and hard-coded, in effect, uh, implementations for, uh, for common uh, uh, methods that lists and collections have. For example, is empty is always true. Head is going to return um, an exception. Tail is also going to, to return an exception, and, uh, and so on. Um, Here's another, uh, another example. We see it in uh, actually many places uh, in the Scala library. The fact that uh, every time that we create uh, an empty instance of an object, instance, in fact, we do not really create it. So option uh, has two uh, subclasses. The first one is uh, sum, and the second one is none. None. Uh, naturally is an object and not, uh, and not a class, which means that every time that you use done, in fact, you, you just point to the, same, uh, to the same object. The same happens for sets. So this is the code for set. Every time that I create an empty set, in fact, it's an object. I do not really allocate it. But in set, actually in list as well, uh, if you look at the implementation, you will see something weird. So whenever I add an element, it actually returns a new set one. So what is set one? Let's go to set one. So now we see that set one is an optimized representation for a mutable set of size one. So actually there is an, a separate class for a set of size one, which doesn't have any hash code computation because there can be only up to one member. Actually, in fact, exactly one member, right? Because the empty set is, is a different uh, object. In this case, it's obviously a class because it has a state. Uh, and when we call plus on this, we are going to return set two, which is another specialized hard code in implementation for sets of size two. Same happens for set, for set three. And uh, only here, finally, we have the hash set initialized, which means that actually we have up to four levels of, uh, of uh, highly specialized collections. And only then we. Um, we instantiate a generic one. The reason for this is actually based on, uh, on uh, some uh, uh, other research that, uh, that uh, Martin Odersky has talked about, which, which, in which he says that in most cases, in most practical cases, we have tons of very small collections in the code. 
and, uh, and it's a very pragmatic approach to, to say that, hey, we want a specialized implementation for this. And uh, so there are specialized implementations for sets, for lists, but also for many others, uh, other immutable collections as well. So uh, let's get a bit familiar with the structure of the, of the type hi hierarchy of the immutable collections. It's quite convenient, actually, to, to start with the bottom, because these are the ones that we are familiar with. Uh, so string and array are actually an interesting uh, example, because both of them are not uh, Scala types. They are Java types. So what happens here is that they become index sequences only because there is an implicit conversion to them. Okay, so, so they feel like Scala collections, but in fact, uh, they are very low-level Java, Java collection. And, and there are many reasons why do not, we do not want to change this. For example, we have a string interning, right? We have uh, all the uh, low-level uh, bytecode and, uh, and uh, machine uh, operations that, uh, that allow us to efficiently um, work with arrays. So we do want to only, uh, only provide them additional functionality and uh, um, a better uh, interoperability with, uh, with Scala, but we do not have a very strong reason to, to rewrite them. Some would disagree. Um, OK, another one is a range. So a range is, uh, let's say that I say 1 to uh, 1,000 by 10. In fact, when I uh, defined or instantiated as such an object, I do not really allocate uh, 100 objects, or, right? Uh, I only need to know uh, the, the beginning, the end, and the step. And I need to know whether it's an inclusive or exclusive uh, uh, range. But it feels like a collection. And this is the, the very convenient uh, part about it, because it, uh, it extends uh, index sequence. Um, OK, so now let's talk about the vector for a second. A vector, unlike an array, um, has uh, some uh, tricks which uh, allow it to, to better handle uh, fragmentations of uh, frag fragmentation in memory. So if you try to allocate an array with, uh, with uh, uh, 4 billion uh, members, it's going to, very, uh, to be very difficult uh, for the JVM to, to allocate uh, a continuous block. And, uh, uh, even if it manages to do this, uh, there is going to be a penalty because, uh, because we are going to lose locality in some cases and we, we often need it. Um, in the case of a vector, the way that it's built, it's a hierarchical structure of arrays uh, that, uh, that is actually limited by, uh, if I remember correctly, five levels. And, uh, and this assumption uh, basically allows a very efficient implementation uh, of uh, constant access time for uh, random access. Um, list, as we mentioned before, is a linked list, okay, an immutable one. A stream is a linked list with a lazy tail. Uh, a queue and a stack, I do not have anything interesting to say about them. We see that, uh, that uh, there is a distinction between indexed uh, sequences and uh, linear sequences. And both of them in, uh, inherit from a sequence. Um, I do encourage you to, to just work with the, with the Scala library source code and uh, go uh, dive deeper into the implementation of each one of them. It's a great way to learn uh, idiomatic Scala. And uh, it's a great, great way to learn what happens behind the scenes. That's how I uh, found out that uh, all these peculiar facts about uh, uh, specialized collections. OK. So we see that, uh, that actually uh, this diagram is uh, very partial, because now we saw that there are many more implementations of set, for example, set one and set two. But that probably would have been too overwhelming. Uh, and we have the, the maps. That's actually a partial list, because there are more. There, uh, there is another dimension of a collection, which is the, the parallel collections. Okay, so we talked about mutable versus immutable, but uh, we also have uh, parallel collections which uh, try to minimize the, the number of flocks and the, and the locality, and maximize the locality of flocks. These are the mutable collections. We have more of these. So buffer and uh, 
Uh, an array buffer is a mutable uh, uh, version uh, um, of, uh, of an array, right? Uh, of, uh, though an array is mutable. A list buffer is a mutable uh, version of a, of a list. The main uh, difference is that uh, array buffer uh, uh, provides a constant access for uh, random uh, access. Um, OK, I think that that's enough. There are many more. You're uh, encouraged to, to explore more about this. Uh, now the fun part, one-liners. Okay, that's something that we like about Scala, and uh, that's a way to, to win uh, this con key. So the first one is, uh, let's say that we want to compute a derivative. Okay. Uh, so we have uh, uh, numbers, you're right. And uh, one way to, to compute a derivative that's obviously not the only one, but that's a very functional way, is to zip the numbers with the tail of the numbers, and then map each pair that I'm getting to, um, to the difference between them. Now let's, uh, let's take a step backward and explain a bit in details what I just said. So who knows what zip does? Not bad. OK, so uh, what zip does, it's very similar to, to zipping. Uh, it's taking a collection of pairs and producing, uh, sorry, taking a pair of collections and producing a collection of pairs with corresponding elements. OK? Pairs obviously are represented as tuples. Um, tail returns a list which doesn't contain the first element. So it creates this shift that we need in order to, to get all the consecutive pairs. And now all we need to do is, uh, is basically map this to, to the difference. And uh, we are getting a very um, simplified version of, uh, of a derivative. Now if I want to, to find uh, the, uh, the points with the maximal derivatives, uh, do you see any, uh, any small change that uh, would allow me to do this? OK, think about it for a few seconds. In the meantime, I would ask you a second question. What can be improved in this solution uh, performance-wise? Without using uh, imperative code, obviously. Yeah. Perfect. I think I, uh, maybe I posted it on SlideShare by mistake or something. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. So uh, what happens here is that zip creates a new collection, right? Uh, because uh, uh, one of the principles uh, uh, in Scala collections is that every transformation that we make, if it produces a collection, unless it's explicitly specified otherwise, it's going to, be pr to produce a collection of the same type as the source collection that it's applied on. For example, if we have an iterator and we apply a, a map on it, the result is going to be an iterator. Same uh, if we had a, a set and we apply a filter on it, we are going to get a filtered set. Okay? The explicit, yes, so, go ahead. Right, uh, so, so uh, Omer is right. You can actually do sliding. Actually, maybe we can, we can even uh, try it right away. So, so if we have a, a collection, uh, yeah, sure. Okay. So uh, if we have a, a collection, let's say one to ten, Oops. and we want to to get uh, all the consecutive pairs, so we can just do sliding uh, two. Okay, and now. We got an iterator, because sliding returns an iterator. There are very few functions uh, that do return uh, um, an iterator, like uh, uh, combinations, permutations, uh, and sliding, and a few more. So let's materialize it. Okay? And now we see that we actually got, uh, uh, got all the consecutive pairs. So this solution is, in fact, more elegant than the one that I wrote. Thanks. Okay. Let's continue from here. So, but we still want to know what view does. Basically, what view does, it, uh, it creates a, a, a lazy view of the collection that, that, uh, that allows us, that basically serves as a proxy, and all the 
uh, all the um, actions or, uh, or uh, operations that we perform on the view, it feels like it's still a, a collection, but in fact, what we produce is a view. So it's a wrapped uh, representation of the collection that, uh, that allows us to, to perform a sequence of transformations without actually allocating intermediate objects. It's, it's very different than, than a stream. A stream is lazy, but, uh, but it gets materialized uh, eventually. And it's also different than uh, an iterator, because an iterator, uh, it, has a, it is stateful. A stream is also stateful, but an iterator doesn't uh, grow the more, uh, the larger part of it you, you materialize, right? And a material, uh, an iterator is only going to store the, the current, the pointer to the current uh, state or member. Um, and here is a, a bonus question, right? So what's the answer? Sorry? Yeah, it's good enough. In fact, max by is going to return uh, uh, to return the pair that has the the highest slope, but that's that's close enough, right? So instead of map, we will just write here max by, and it's going to to use this as the criteria for uh, finding the max uh, element. You can name it. No, it was just a simplistic example that I uh, played with. Um, OK, so here's another example. Um, we want to count uh, the occurrences of, uh, of characters in this string. Um, so let's, let's mention a few, a few key points here. The first one is that we see that we can uh, basically use all the collection operations on strings, which means that a string is actually a collection, or at least it's, uh, it's implicitly converted to, to something which is called string opts, uh, which uh, exposes all the, uh, all the operations. The second thing that uh, is uh, the group by function, it uh, does uh, exactly what you would expect. You provide it a function, and then it groups all the elements. Uh, according to this function, it produces a map. The key is going to be the result of the, of the application of this function. And the value is going to be a list of all the elements from the original collection uh, that contains, uh, th for which this predicate uh, holds, right? But uh, the, uh, it's a very important point. What it produces, in fact, is not a list, but rather the original representation, right? We talked about preserving the, the type or the representation of the, of the original collection after applying the, the transformation. Now, what's this? So identity is basically a, the identity function. It's similar to x uh, arrow x, right? Uh, it's part of the pre-def of, uh, of what comes uh, in the global scope of, the, uh, of Scala. Uh, and uh, and uh, the other interesting function would be map values. So we could group. Uh, okay, let's actually play with this uh, with this example for a second. So let's say that I uh, uh, encyclopedia group by identity. Okay, as you can see, I'm getting a map from character to a string. Now, if I want to um, to transform it, I can use map, and then I have some pair, right? And I want to take the pair, uh, only the, the right-hand side of the pair, and get the size of it, okay? Because I want only the, the frequencies. If I did not want to do it, I would uh, just do this, okay? And now I produced uh, a histogram that also has the keys. But that's very, very ugly, right? I, I need to, if I do not want to, to convert the keys, I want to preserve them, I still need to, to explicitly mention them. And this is, this is exactly what map values uh, helps us with. So if I do map values, 
Now my, transform, uh, my transformation function is going to be applied only on the values, which means that I can just say I want the size. Okay. So this is it. Um, the other example would be word engrams. So in this case, uh, we have a, uh, we have a, a text, right? And we want to to produce all the engrams of this text. What are engrams? Uh, engrams are the consecutive members of a constant size of size n. In this case, I want engrams that range from uh, unigrams to three grams. Okay. Which means uh, hello, sweet world, hello, sweet, sweet world, and, and the uh, three of them. Okay. This is actually very, uh, a very common uh, technique with, uh, when you want to index text or perform some uh, natural language processing. I defined a function here named tokenize. This function uh, just splits the string using uh, white space. It's a very primitive uh, way to do this. Uh, the reason why I wrote it is, is to show that you can assign functions to, to variables, right? Uh, because functions are a first class citizen. Um, and then all I need to do is basically take the range. The range is one to three. And for each one of the, of the values here, let's say that size is one, okay? We are going to tokenize the text and then use the sliding window that uh, Omer just uh, uh, mentioned before uh, of size size, OK? If we just used map instead of flat map here, we would have got a, a list of, uh, of arrays, right? Uh, or a collection of a collections. Flat map just allows us to, to map and flatten at the same time. That's a convenience method. OK. Uh, that's another uh, example. Uh, uh, in this case, we want to find, uh, to check whether all the members of, uh, of A are greater than B. In this case, the answer is true, right? Because 2 is greater than 1, 3, then 2, and 4, then 3. Uh, and uh, through this example, I would like to explore and expose you to some of the, of the concepts in Scala as well. So here's one way to do this. I can say, OK, uh, this, this is probably the most, uh, this approach is the most uh, imperative, right? More, uh, most Java-like, right? I have some, uh, some uh, uh, indices that I need to, to iterate over. And for each one of them, I'm going to access some, uh, some collection and uh, check the value. That's how we would have done this in Java. What's the problem with this? The first one is, is that's just an implementation detail. Because list is, uh, you cannot uh, access uh, a member of a list by index in a constant time because it's a linked list. So, uh, so in this case, it's uh, it's uh, uh, n squared. So let's try a, a different one. We already know the zip function, right? The zip function is going to take uh, corresponding elements from a and b and produce uh, a collection of pairs, and then. We will just uh, use this uh, uh, the for all function and uh, basically check this predicate for each one of the of the pairs. What's the problem with this one? That uh, just like we learned in the previous example, that we that zip is going to create uh, a, a temporary list. View would help in this case, and also. Um, uh, zip is going to create uh, tuples, right? And we do not want to, to allocate these as well. So here's another example. In this case, we do not create the, the temporary list anymore, but we still create the pairs. Can we avoid this? And that's another quiz question for you. Sorry? Um, no, it will, it will not happen in this case. OK. We want to avoid allocating the, the, the tuples, right? So here's one way to do it. We have a, a, the corresponds function. 
And what uh, corresponds uh, basically does, it, uh, it has two iterators. And it's going to, to advance the, the iterators uh, uh, one by one, right? Uh, in tandem, two, two of them together. And for each one of the pairs that, uh, that uh, uh, in fact, it it's not really a pair, it's going to, to call this function. Okay. So that's, that's also a more elegant way to do this. So no the corresponds function. Sorry? What happens when one is shorter? Um, let's check. So if I have a 1 to 10, and I want to, to zip it with a, a to z, right? 1 is obviously shorter. Here's what we get. The answer is going to be that uh, that it will only check it for the minimal size that's of this. The, uh, the corresponds? I don't know. Oh, let's check. Uh, <laughs> yeah, why not? No, you can't because it uh, it's not a mapper, right? It's a okay. Here's another example. Um, so I think we we talked a bit. Uh, I mentioned it before that strings are in fact uh, collections, and the way that it's done the uh, it, that it's done is that there is the augment string function uh, inside pre-def. Pre-def is a class where you, you will see many of the, um, of the functions and conversions that, uh, that make you wonder how it uh, operate, interoperates so well with Java. So the, most of the answers are there, but not all of them. Um, basically, what happens is that the string is converted to string ops that, uh, that just wraps it and, uh, and provides additional, uh, um, additional operations. We see that string is uh, implicitly uh, can be implicitly inferred from string ops, which uh, uh, which in turn is uh, a subclass of string like, and that one is an of index sec optimized. Uh, there are more than ten uh, layers of uh, of abstraction there. It's a very complex uh, web of uh, traits there. Um, okay. Let's talk a bit about the complexity of uh, collection operators. So I have no idea how this got here, but, uh, but all the, the, the followers, uh, the following, uh, the mappers, which are map and collect, are uh, obviously linear. Uh, the reducers, like reduce, fold left, fold right, as well as the scan that we, that we mentioned, are uh, linear. Same for, for each, filter, index, off, reverse. That's not surprising. That's how you would implement it, right? Uh, the uh, union, diff, and intersect are, uh, are also linear, right? They, but they depend on, uh, on uh, two collections. Um, what is collect? Uh, does anyone know what collect is? I believe that you know, so I want to ask you. Uh, only if uh, the pattern match uh, matches. You do collect, and then uh, do a pattern match. Only if the pattern match uh, uh, happens, uh, then you take uh, the result. If it doesn't, uh, it doesn't include the right. The and uh, if you had to explain it uh, uh, in terms of uh, a mix between two other functions, what yeah, would this be? Map. Perfect. Yeah. So so it's uh, it's what happens when you combine filter and map. Uh, and also, it's very important to to mention that uh, that collect operates on partial functions, right? Which means that uh, that if the that the pattern matching doesn't really need to be exhaustive. If there is no match, no error is going to, to happen. But uh, but we will just skip this. Okay. Um, so these were the obvious ones, and uh, and these depend on the on the implementation of uh, of the, each one of the data structures. So this slide talks about the immutable collections. 
we see that, uh, that basically accessing the head uh, in all the immutable collections is going to be either effectively constant or constant, right? And uh, it's obvious why, right? Uh, accessing the first element of a linked list is constant. Uh, same for, for tail, in, except for string. Any guess why, uh, why for string it's uh, linear and not constant? Yeah? Right, because string is not really perfect, so we need to copy it. Um, OK, let's see. All these are trivial. Can, uh, can you also explain why uh, update is uh, linear for most of them? Because you can maybe expand. Ah, update. Um, ah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, OK, we see that prepending is constant for this for the same reason that, that head is constant, right? Because prepending is always cheaper when we have the reference to the first element. But appending is going to be linear in all of them because we actually need to, to get to the end. Um, except for Q, obviously. Uh, we see that in mutable collection, it's not this. Uh, the head is not different. Okay, tail is uh, is uh, obviously. Uh, why is tail linear? Because because we do need to to copy this time, right? Okay. And uh, here's another bonus question: What's the complexity of range dot sum? Depends on the version of scalar. Sorry. Depends on the version of scalar. Yes. Wow. Well. Yes, you're right. Yes. So this is the answer. Uh, this is the commit note from, uh, from GitHub uh, that actually fixes this uh, problem. It used to be linear. And then someone had a brilliant idea of how to make it uh, constant. And this is the, I think I had the implementation. Yeah, this is the implementation. Uh, here we see that the sum is now a closed formula, right? as we would expect it to be. Uh, okay, so uh, who knows what the equals hash code contract is without looking at the slide? Two objects. Yeah? Two objects are equal, they must have the same hash. Yeah, perfect. So you can read. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so. Yeah. And uh, why do we want this? Uh, that's a more interesting question. Why do we want uh, this contract to, to be in place at all? So we can check equality uh, hash conditions. That's obviously one way, one, uh, one uh, reason. Yeah, let me give you a few examples that, uh, that, uh, that will help. Let's say that we want to, to use uh, an array uh, as a type of the members of a set. Okay? And uh, so why is it a bad idea? Let's start with this. Because the hash code depends on if I create the same array right, uh, twice, it will be. It will have a different hash code because arrays are uh, Java types, and uh, and their hash code is determined by the address. And uh, that's the first reason. And also the equality in this case is uh, is. It depends on the on how we implement it. Um, a set of a vector, on the other hand, is going to to act exactly as you would expect. If you insert a second vector that has the same elements. Uh, you will not get a copy of it, right? So it will really be distinct. Um, a bad idea in this case is, uh, why is this a bad idea? So this is a, a scalar type, right? It's not a Java type. Why is this a bad idea? Right, right. So we do not want keys to be mutable. And uh, when we change, uh, a value of a mutable uh, or a member of a mutable uh, class or an object, then uh, we would expect the, the hash code to, to change as well. In this case, the hash code is actually going to, to change, but the problem is that the set is not going to know that the members changed inside, right? In, uh, if we had to generalize this, uh, any mutable collection is going to be a bad idea to, 
to be a key of a set or a map. Uh, and the good idea, and actually any one of these immutables are uh, very legitimate uh, keys for uh, sets or maps. More about collection equality. So uh, this is uh, this is true. Th that might be surprising to to uh, people who come from uh, Java that this is a range and this is a list, but they are equal. And the reason is that uh, that equality is uh, is more a semantic equality rather than the representation that I chose for uh, for the data structure. Okay. In fact, uh, it, it would be the same for a vector or uh, or most of the collections. But uh, there is a pitfall. If uh, in this case it's one to three, what about one to four billion? And, uh, and uh, if I used very large ranges as keys to, to a hash set, that would be very unfortunate. Uh, the reason for this is, and that's actually a bonus question that if you solve, uh, you, you might be able to speed up uh, Scala significantly, if you can propose a closed formula to compute a hash code of a range. So currently, the way that, uh, that a hash code of a range is implemented is using uh, the sequence hash. Uh, of uh, more more hash, it's, it's a fast implementation, for, uh, good for uh, for sequences, but uh, it's linear in time, right? The reason why it's used is so that it would be, have the same hash code as the the equivalent list or a vector, for obvious reasons. But that's not efficient. There is actually an interesting discussion about this. Um, okay. I'm not going to wait for the answer. Oh, you have the answer. Uh, one question. Like, if a range is represented by a few, like a finite set of numbers, right? You have the start, the end, yeah. you just match them, and that's it. No? But if you do this, you will not get the same value as uh, if you hash all the members of an equivalent list. Oh, you have to, uh, you have to match the, the exact same uh, hash. Yeah. So that's the challenge. Uh, there might be an answer. I just I haven't proved that it's impossible. Um, OK, a bit about uh, Java interoperability. So I think that uh, two people uh, today mentioned that we have the Java conversions. I want to dive deeper into this and also uh, explain the distinction between the Java conversions and the Java converters. One of them is implicit. The other one is uh, explicit. Uh, the implicit one means that there is no uh, less boilerplate, because you do not need to actually add this uh, function or a method they call that, uh, that transforms them. And uh, the explicit gives you a better control and uh, is considered to be safer. Five minutes, OK. Um, so in this case, all we have to do in order to use this is import, this, import the, both the implicit or, uh, or the explicit. And uh, the implicit ones are going to be transparent as you, you would guess. So you can take any Java conversion and uh, use any Scala function on it. And in the case of the explicit, you do need to, to say as Scala, and then you can start uh, applying it. OK, so that's a, that's a sidetrack, I would say. Uh, it is possible to. Uh, to solve pathfinding problems in compile time in Scala without running the code. The following code will not compile if there is no uh, path between, uh, uh, in this case, uh, D and B, from B to D. Okay? These are the vertices. These define the edges. Okay? And, uh, and uh, not only that it will not compile if uh, there is no path, but we, it will also print the path uh, when you run it. So you can, uh, that's just a brain teaser. Okay. Uh, this is probably a, maybe a good uh, segue to, to Eugene's talk uh, later about what you can do in compile time. That's just a, a sneak peek, and that's not even macros. But uh, what uh, happens behind the scenes here is uh, just a set of implicit conversions that define the edges. So they're just a trick that you can use uh, 
how you can leverage the the compiler and the, the Scala type system to to make it work for you to solve uh, problems in compile time. If you want to go pro, there are two two places that I would recommend you to to look into. The first one is uh, Shapeless, uh, a library by Miles Sabin, uh, who is uh, now in uh, Precog. Um, so this is a library that allows you to, to define uh, basically polytypic lists, for example. They're called H lists. In this case, uh, in this list, every, um, in every position you may have a different type, but the type of the list is not any, right? Not the, the list upper bound of all the elements. You can define and declare them in compile time, and the compiler will, will warn you or fail if uh, if you're performing any operations that do not comply to the type constraints, uh, that's just like uh, uh, tuples that scale infinitely. Think about it this way. Uh, the other interesting library to to look into is uh, the Scalaxy, which is uh, it started as a library that allows you to compile Scala to the GPU. Uh, now, uh, uh, am I right? Uh, uh, they're using macros as well, right? I think they're using macros, yeah. Uh, Everyone's using macros today. Yeah. So yeah, the, basically it allows you to, to take uh, basic and common collection operations and make them uh, very fast using macros. That's all. Thanks.